What's up, AP Physics 1 students? We're looking at Unit 8, FRQ3 from AP Physics Classroom Progress Checks. I'm Mr. Heinrich. Great to see you. Let's get after it. And this is our system. We've got a container with water. It has a stopper at the bottom. We can definitely remove that stopper and let water shoot out. We have this meter stick to measure heights and distances. We are going to leave the container on top of the table, but we also have, check out the wording down here, books which can be used to raise the height of the container. So I'm going to leave it right here in case you want to pause it and read it. I'm moving on to part A. Describe an experimental procedure for collecting data that can be graphed to find the speed of the liquid coming from the container. Include any steps necessary to reduce experimental uncertainty. Step 1. Place container near edge of table. Measure the height of the opening of the hole from the ground. And we'll call this delta y. Okay. Step 2. Pull the stopper and observe where the stream of water hits the ground. Measure this distance from the base of the table. And we'll call that delta x. In fact, I do recommend you drawing a picture that goes with this description so that the reader can see what you're talking about. Step 3. Plug the hole. Refill the container to the same height and place one textbook under the container to make the system taller. Then we would say repeat steps one and two for this new height. Awesome. And finally, step four, let's see if I can fit it in. Repeat steps one through three for multiple textbooks to reduce experimental uncertainty. And I'm going to stop it right there, but that says multiple and we should say textbooks to reduce experimental uncertainty. Make sure you finish off that step statement. But that's going to set us up with plenty of delta y's and plenty of delta x's so we can do part b and find the velocity of that fluid coming out of the opening using graphical analysis. Let's head over to part b. Part b, describe how the data collected in part a could be graphed and how that graph would be analyzed to determine the speed of the liquid as it leaves the hole in the container. So before I describe anything verbally, I'm going to make sure to describe what I'm doing mathematically. And you are certainly welcome to do that when you're answering these FRQs. Don't shy away from the math. It often proves the point better than words can sometimes. So first and foremost, we're going to set up our equations for this projectile motion scenario. So if this is velocity and this is delta x, I know I have a kinematic equation that will apply both to the x-axis and the y-axis. So I'm going to say delta x equals initial velocity times time plus one-half ax t squared. Now at this point in the game, I know you know that in the x-axis there is no acceleration. The only acceleration that exists is gravitational acceleration in the y-axis, and therefore this ax is zero, making this entire term zero. So let's plug in to this equation. Delta x equals, and I'll call this the velocity of the water, times time. And that's as far as we can take that equation. Let's go to the y-axis next. I'm going to write the same exact equation except for the y-axis. Delta y equals viy t plus one-half ay t squared. And if you remember Remember your projectile motion, which I'm sure you do, when you have this kind of situation where the projectile is going out strictly horizontally when it first leaves the table, there is no initial y velocity. It's all in the x-axis. So we're going to call initial velocity in the y-axis zero, which makes this entire term zero. And we'll have delta y equals one half a y t squared. One more iteration here. Remember, delta y is technically a negative value because we're displacing downward. And Ay is negative 9.8 meters per second squared, or negative g. So if I put a negative g there, and I put a negative delta y there, what happens to my negatives? They cancel out. So let's not even bother with putting in the negative. And that's what we get. Delta y equals 1 half gt squared. So at this point, I'm going to take this equation and this equation and bring them together through time. Remember, time is the quantity that both the x and the y axis share. I would say t equals the square root of 2 delta y divided by g. And I'll take this time expression and I'll plug it in for that t. So I'm going to rewrite this equation now right here. 
delta x equals v water times square root of 2 delta y over g. And there's our answer right there. We can see that delta x, if placed on my y-axis, and square root of 2 delta y over g, if placed on my x-axis, would yield a slope that is equal to the velocity of the water. So let's just make a quick statement and we're done with part b. If the distance of the water from the edge of the table, I'll remind them that's delta x, is plotted on the the y-axis and the square root of 2 delta y over g is plotted on the x-axis, then a slope equal to the velocity of the water will result. And that's part b. All done. Let's head over to part c. In a different experiment, the students use the same container filled with a liquid of unknown density. The students use a pressure sensor to measure the gauge pressure of the liquid at the location of the hole. They then remove the stopper and collect the data to determine the speed at which the liquid exits the container. They repeat the experiment with different amounts of liquid in the container. Their collected data are shown in the table below. So here's the table below. We have a bunch of pressures which resulted from different heights of this unknown liquid in the container. And as a result of different heights of liquid, we get different exit velocities from the hole. So keeping that in mind, the students correctly determined that the relationship between the gauge pressure and the speed of the liquid leaving the hole is given by P gauge equals one half rho V squared. The students create a graph with P gauge plotted on the vertical axis. So keeping all of that in mind, what is C1 asking us? Essentially, what are we going to put on the horizontal axis knowing that P gauge is on the vertical axis so that I get a slope and from that slope it's either going to give me the density of the liquid or give me some expression from which I can calculate the density of the liquid. So that's what we need to do in part C1. Well, they gave us the equation right here, so this is actually pretty easy. So if you look at this like the equation of a line like we just did, y equals mx. They already did it for us. So p gauge is on the y-axis. One half rho, or one half the density of the liquid, can be our slope, and v squared can be our horizontal axis. And if you don't want to do it like that, you don't have to. Instead, we could say p gauge will go on the y-axis, v squared over 2 could go on the horizontal axis, and then the slope would be directly equal to the density of the liquid. And I think that's the way I'm going to go. All right, there's C1 all done. I have v squared over 2 on the horizontal axis. I place that at the top of this header. There's the unit. They do want us to include units if we're going to have a new quantity, which we do. And I took each one of these numbers, I squared them, and then divided them by 2 to arrive at these values, which I rounded to the nearest tenth place. Okay, let's go on to C2 and graph this information. For the sake of reference, we have all of our P gauge values right here. We have all our V squared over 2 values right here. I scaled the horizontal axis. I set my top value in the X axis is 9.7. So we're going to divide that by 50 boxes, which gave me 0.194, which is very close to 0.2. That means each box is worth 0.2. So 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. And then one, repeat that for the rest of the horizontal axis. And notice for the y axis, it uses the same scale. Every box is a 0 0.2, resulting in every five boxes being a full one. Now remember, you need to label your axis with both quantity and unit. And I've done that down here for the x axis. There's our quantity and there's our unit. It's time to plot this data. Okay, there is my plotted data, and you can see I have one data point that's not very good, but that's okay because in C3, we're going to do the line of best fit, and we're going to average out all of this data. Let's do that next, C3. Okay, C3 is done. There's our line of best fit. I need to find two points along this average line that perfectly intersect the graph paper. So there's my two points. I've made them hollow circles so that you can see them. I'm going to write the coordinate that goes with that one and with that one. And there we have it. Those are my two coordinates, 3.8, 3.0, and 6.4, 5.0. Let's do part D. And before we move on to part D, I wanted you to see the wording for C2 and C3. Notice those are the things we just did. In part D, calculate an experimental value for the density rho of the liquid using the best fit line that you drew in figure two in part C3. Let's go to the paper. 
okay, there's my set of coordinates, there's my equation for slope. We know this slope will directly give us the liquid density, but there's one more curveball they're throwing us. You might have already seen it. Our y-axis is in kilopascals. So when I have five here, it actually means 5,000 pascals. And I want to make sure that I'm working in pascals, which are newtons per meter squared. So it agrees with my x values, which are measured in meters squared per second squared. We always want unit agreement. So for this y2, I'm plugging in 5,000 pascals minus 3,000 pascals all over 6.4 meters squared per second squared minus 3.8 meters squared per second squared. Taking this down, I'll have 2,000. And I'm going to change now from pascal to what a pascal is. It's a newton per meter squared all over 6.4 minus 3.8 is 2.6 meters squared per second squared. And this answer yields 769.2 kilogram per meter cubed. And that is the unit of density. Remember, mass per unit volume is what density is. Now I'm sure some of you want to see how this ugly unit works out to kilograms per meters cubed. Stick around, I'm going to show you, but if you're all done, see you later. Here comes the unit analysis. Okay, unit analysis. Newtons per meter squared all over meter squared per second squared. So what I'll do first is just flip this whole thing around and put in place of the newton a kilogram meter per second squared because that's what a newton is. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by second squared over meter squared. And I plug that in for the newton there over meter squared times this thing. And you can see the second squareds cross out. And you can see that this meter crosses out with one of these meters, leaving you with meters times meters squared. Hello, that's meters cubed. And a kilogram is right there. So finally, we would say kilogram per meter cubed. Okay, that's it for this one. Have a great day. Mr. Heinrich, I'm out of here. Like and subscribe. I'll talk to you soon.